Coming up on Digital Music Trends 162, recorded on the 18th of December 2013, we discuss Beyoncé's surprise release, talk about the digital music news of 2013 that are likely to leave a mark into next year, discuss the iTunes Best of 2013 apps, the future for music tech innovation and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linaldi and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as an audio and video show on a variety of channels, I always list them all, but they include iTunes, most pod- pod- podcatchers, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio and Audioboo. To get in touch with the show, you can contact us on at uh, Music Trends or email contact at digitalmusictrends.com. And as I mentioned last week, there's now a voluntary subscription option on the homepage of the site if you want to donate a few dollars a month to keep the show going that it's fantastic so uh, head on to digitalmusictrends.com and go and check that out and this is the last news show for 2013 next week DMT will sp- feature a special show with the CEO of the Econest in lieu of the normal show and then uh, the week after there's going to be some sort of best of I'm still working on that and uh, the show will resume as normal on the 9th of January and it's a great way to end the year with some fantastic guests this year starting with Glenn Peoples a senior editorial analyst at Billboard so hi Glenn and great to have you on how's it going? Good, good. Thanks for having me again. Good it's, to see you. It's a great to have you on, and thanks so much for joining us. And I know that you're probably still a bit jet lagged from from your travels, so it's a, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, uh, then we have uh, uh, Michael Rothman, editor in chief at Consequence of Sound, which is a great resource for music news and uh, reviews as well. So hi, Michael, and great to have you on. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's it's great to have you, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've I've been reading uh, Consequence for for a while, so it's uh, it's it's really great to have you. And uh, uh, and finally, a big thank uh, thank you to uh, Darren Hemmings, uh, who's uh, joining us uh, uh, at the last second because uh, we had uh, somebody uh, fall ill. Uh, but he's the founder of digital market marketing agency Motive Unknown, and it's a really <coughs> perfect way to end the year actually because uh, uh, Darren has been amazing throughout this year, and it's been uh, one of our most frequent guests. So uh, great to have you on. Thank you. I'm I'm glad I was so not busy that I was able to step in. (laughs) It's great when you get an email and you just sat there drumming your fingers on the desk. So uh, here I am again. That's perfect. Like a rash that you can't shake off. No, that's really good. It says nothing about how how busy and important you are. (laughs) I know, right? I've probably just massively dented my credibility in, in copying to the fact that I was potentially a bit of a loose end when the email came through. <laughs> but, uh, Plus, it's, it's also the Christmas lull, you know, or, or, as, as, as the listeners will find yeah. out uh, today, <laughs> it's not a massive news day and uh, I kind of have to really send a big thank you card to Beyonce because otherwise we wouldn't probably have a show today. <laughs> <laughs> talking about the weather a lot, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. So, yeah. and so, uh, of course, that's the one story that we really have to cover today uh, at, uh, at some length. And uh, I know, Darren, you've written a very interesting uh, uh, sort of... Uh, piece uh, on your on your daily newsletter uh, and uh, which you can find on motiveunknown.com little plug there and so i, I want to open with the answer so uh, if you were uh, hiding uh, somewhere or with your head under the sand uh, uh, you won't know this, but otherwise you'll probably know that Beyonce released a new album, uh, you know, uh, on a f- a Friday, uh, um, and uh, uh, this was her first release uh, since 2011, and it was released without any uh, pre-release campaign whatsoever, uh, any promotion. It just dropped out of the blue. It was an iTunes exclusive. It was released worldwide just on iTunes uh, for at least a week. And the album was available as a bundle only as well, so no option to purchase individual tracks at least until the 20th of December, and it. Uh, went all it all went crazy like social media went crazy the press went crazy uh, everybody was on it and uh, it generated 600, 617,000 uh, downloads uh, in the US alone on iTunes and 211,000 uh, globally outside the US so it was the biggest uh, uh, you know and the fastest uh, uh, release uh, digitally for iTunes uh, yet uh, so Beyonce said she was tired of the normal sales cycles and wanted to get rid of the middleman. And, uh, you know, these days it's almost close to impossible keeping anything like this under wraps, especially when it's a major artist. So I want to start with that, first of all. You know, how do, how do you guys reckon that this was kept under the lid, especially considering that there were 14 videos made for, for, for the album? And uh, do you think that it was a pure fluke or, you know, is it still possible to maintain secrecy in this day and age in, in, in the music industry? Uh, Ma- Michael, do you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, I think, you know, secrecy is very hard uh, to keep nowadays, but also if you're the right person, you're the right artist, I think that you can, um, you have the right people to kind of maintain it for you. Um, I mean, Kanye 
you know, blindsides us all the time um, with, you know, album announcements and same thing with Tom York and Radiohead. And um, I mean, there's, there's a select few and then Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails is, is also great at doing that. Yeah. I mean, I think Beyonce is probably be- you know, better off than any of them to be able to do this. And the fact that she, it was kind of like, um, oh, what do they call it? The, uh, there's that, that, uh, <laughs> there's that kind of metaphor that they use in catch me if you can with the, the pinstripes, the Yankees and the pinstripes. And it's kind of like, um, it, I feel like that's kind of like the way it was with Beyonce this year. You know, she did the Super Bowl thing. She did the world tour, but amidst, in the midst of all of this, she was going around the world, probably filming videos and, you know, collaborating with a lot of people, um, and recording this album. And, you know, we were all, you know, I'm sure everyone was thinking that she was recording something at some right. time. I don't think there was any doubt that she's not always recording, especially if you've seen her HBO documentary. Um, I, I think that um, by having like, you know, the big, the big show and the big world tour, um, it not only was able to kind of generate interest throughout the year to keep her name out in the spotlight, um, but it also gave her kind of flexibility to be able to, you know, work with people all around the world and be able to do her thing right. while also keeping everybody, you know, entertained with this, you know, this huge, you know, I mean, she's the biggest, one of the biggest stars in the world and everybody wants to go see her. Yeah. So while being able to do that, she is able to kind of, you know, go off and do her own thing and record and, and dangle this album, you know, and kind of joke around that it was going to come out in 2014 and, I'm sure, you know, everybody at her label thought that as well. Um, but I, I think by, I think there's, I think you can't, I don't think you can just automatically just kind of, you know, whisk yourself away yeah. and then go off and record. Cause I mean, there's, there, there's going to be anticipation there. So I think the idea that she was in the spotlight and she was doing something big, like a world tour, she just had a child. Um, you know, she just did the Super Bowl. I don't think, I mean, she was there, but, I think everybody was expecting to have some sort of huge pre rollout like Lady Gaga or yeah, like yeah, sure. Katy Perry or, you know, even like Justin Timberlake who, you know, did yeah. you know, the, the video teaser. So So that's that that's cool. And and Glenn, you were away, but you came back uh, on uh, on uh, Sunday night, I guess, so uh, with uh, with this big development. So so how do you think they pulled that off? <clears throat> well I, I can't say that I know much about Beyonce as an artist. Yeah. Um, and I don't I, I don't cover that that sort of thing for Billboard. Sure. But I have a few guesses here. One is that there were a lot of non-disclosure agreement signs to keep people from talking. Um, and I think, I think people need to realize that um, the public and the press find, usually find out what the artist and the management and the, and the PR agent want us to find out. So if nobody's digging, if nobody's doing investigative reporting, then nobody's going to find out that Beyonce is working on an album and that the album could potentially come very soon. Yeah. We find out what people want us to find out. I think, I think we find that out, uh, you know, in politics all the time, right? It happens yeah. elsewhere. <laughs> sure. So, so it's, it's not that surprising to me that, that somebody could release an album unexpectedly. Right. Um, and I think, and I think that David Bowie did it and showed that uh, it's very possible. Yeah. And it's even a little more remarkable because Beyonce is always in the spotlight, and so maybe maybe what she's doing right in front of people's noses um, doesn't even get people thinking about you know what her release schedule might be. Sure. Um, and I also were talking about a genre where there's co- collaborations are essential. So that's another part of it. You're trying to keep the collaborators from saying anything about it. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a lot of cat herding, I imagine, but. I think if Beyonce can do it, anybody can do it. And then again, not everybody can do this and have a successful strategy. Um, you know, beyond this works because Beyonce is now an album artist and not a singles artist. And a lot of a lot of people haven't made that transition to getting fans to buy tracks and then getting track buyers to buy albums. And, and she's done that. So this is a strategy that can work for her. Yeah. And Darren, of course, you know, everybody's mind turns to Lady Gaga and uh, Art Hop is a quintessentially an, an album's album. There aren't really a great deal of huge singles on it, at least none that have broken through yet. And uh, and so is this something that she should have thought of uh, or, you know, is, is, is Universal sort of regretting doing a huge pre-release campaign, do you think, right now, uh, seeing the numbers that Beyonce managed to, to pull with this? Um, I, I suspect in hindsight, Gargoyle's label is probably wishing they'd have taken this route because I think they spent so long hyping it that when it dropped, it was something of a letdown. Because I think, to be honest, yeah. 
um, that album isn't particularly great. You know, it's sort of lacking any big singles and things like that, which then, you know, means it doesn't, you know, you don't get that momentum behind it of the word of mouth of everyone saying how good it is. I mean, it's interesting with the Beyonce release. I swear I've, I've still yet to see anyone actually comment on the, like whether the record is any good because the, the method of its release has just sort of totally eclipsed, yeah. you know, the, the actual music itself. I mean, you know, digging around, it seems like it's pr pretty good. Um, but I don't know beyond that, which I thought was kind of interesting, is like no one's really saying it's a great, great album. We're not talking about the art. We're talking about, uh, you know, the method by which it was delivered. So um, I'm sure people are looking and wishing they'd done it. And I mean, you know, and if you have done it, you know, as Glenn said, there was, you know, Bowie. I don't. I mean, I don't think Bowie, I think Bowie kind of sprung us with this single. I think actually the album was, it wasn't it was quite single, such a... Yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah it wasn't quite, quite such a sort of shock release for the album itself, but his campaign certainly suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Um, you know, and, and even Timberlake, to some extent, had a bit of this, where I don't think anyone knew that he had an album coming, and then suddenly it was like on the imminent landing schedule for, you know, three weeks' time or whatever it was. But yeah. um, there's very few people can do this and get away with it. I mean, I think it's um, it's been quite funny watching the industry sort of try and debate it, because I don't think there's much to debate i mean there's sort of the value of what she's done but trying to read too much into it i think is tricky just because i i, I think one thing everyone's in agreement on is that there are you know very few artists that could probably do this and get away with it in quite that manner um i think the timing was was excellent you know it's not a christmas record uh the general schedule now is kind of certainly in the uk is you know those big releases have come out, you know, there was nothing left in that run up. So she picked a pretty good little vacant spot to, to, you know, drop the bomb in as it were. Um, all of which, you know, hats off to them. I mean, I think it was a great play. Uh, you know, it's worked out very well for, for her and her label. Um, you know, despite the cost of shooting all the videos, you know, initial sort of guesstimates, it would seem, you know, are suggesting that they've still netted a fairly healthy profit to the tune of millions off of this. And, um, you know, I mean, as a marketing person, part of me just sort of, sort of thinks, you know, these things are quite nice because I think it presents an alternative way of looking at stuff. And I really don't think anyone bar about the top five artists on the planet should contemplate a kind of surprise attack move like this. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I like the fact that they they stopped and they thought and they reflected maybe on, on the best uh, path forward. And that's that's a good thing because, you know, we did, certainly. I mean, I read a great piece, and I can't remember which uh, site it was on, but I read it this morning. You know, it was saying that we have seen this year a lot of, frankly, rather sort of overblown campaigns where, you know, you had Katy Perry in this fucking ridiculous truck kind of driving up and down the country. <laughs> when, you know, when the guy writing it kind of said she's got like 42 million social media fans, and yet they think the answer is a, is a big lorry. Um, which broke down, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's kind of, and evidently it did not sort of, well, in light of Beyonce's numbers, certainly did not necessarily yield the uh, the expected response. So, yeah. yeah, there's been a few kind of, you know, uh, high concept campaigns. And so to have this as a counterpoint is, is kind of not a bad thing. I think it's... Uh, it keeps people thinking and it keeps people on their feet, and I think that's quite welcome. Yeah. I, I was yeah. wondering, though, like, uh, you were talking about the fact that this... Of course, it's a one-off, and you know we can't look at it uh, from a, from an analysis point of view as something that mm. will have a, a, a you know a very Im Im a huge impact on the industry. But one of the things that I was thinking about was uh, talking about pre-release and uh, pre-release expenses and what you do once the albums come out. You know, one of the things that I think is being debated at the moment is whether it is worth undergoing these huge pre-release campaigns and then. Once the album drops, if it doesn't do as well in the first week, then essentially it's a dud and it gets, you know, it gets left there to die. And whether, you know, an alternative approach where you actually don't have such a big run up, you save some of that budget to actually push the album once it's out and uh, and try and do it the other way around. Uh, I don't know, Michael, do you reckon that that could be something people might be looking a little bit more carefully into in the future? Um, yeah, I mean, I th I don't like, I mean, I, can, I'm, I'm, I agree that I don't, think that this is you know particularly a trend that's going to be starting um if only because you know like you you, know, you all said said uh i mean I, it does take a particular artist to do this and that yeah. there was so much of a shock that was involved i mean like look at even the 
the Radiohead model from 2007 within Rainbows. I mean, how many people have been able to pull that off again, you know, just to pay what you want? Or um, even, uh, I mean, like Trent Reznor, again, is just, he, he kind of just plopped down albums and, and such. But I mean, they, you know, and then you, a lot of people that are fans even forget about them because yeah. there wasn't a huge event tied to it, like, you know, when he did his Year Zero campaign. Um, I, I think that there is going to be a lot of questions on what, you know, promotional dollars are going to be necessary at this point. I personally, just from, you know, when we write news and we're hyping artists and we're, you know, keeping them in the spotlight, the spotlight. I mean, I, I really do think that once the album's out, I think that really is the biggest work. I, I, I think you need to do the late night performances. I think you need to have the touring. I think you need to have, um, the, the, the weird appearances. I mean, unless you are, um, you know, like a Bowie where, you, you know, you have the prestige where you don't really necessarily have to do that. Um, but even then, I mean, like you could argue that, that Bowie kind of slipped under the, the radar after the album came out. I mean, there wasn't a lot of people talking about it as much. I mean, he had the, the few videos that came out, um, that, I mean, that were great. I mean, especially the Tilda Swinton one. Um, but, uh, you know, it was kind of swept over to the side and same thing with my bloody Valentine. You know, they, they had an album, the first album that was hyped for, almost two decades. I think it was in grade school when I was obsessed with their last album. And I, I, you know, so, but then, you know, that comes out and a lot of people did forget about it until they started writing the year end list or until they start, until they started doing, um, you know, the European tour, um, and appeared at a couple American festivals. I, I just think that a lot of the job for the artist is, is then to, to say, well, how am I going to stay in the spotlight? Like, and I, and I don't think you necessarily need to have the pre album release for that. So I think if they did, have something where they were in that spotlight, whether it's touring or, you know, the appearances or they even hype up something that kind of gets your mind off of just the album. And then the album becomes counterpart to that. I, because I don't, I don't think a lot of people are even racing out to buy albums as much as, as they, as they used to be anymore. Yeah. So I think it is just kind of uh, an excuse at this point to, to do the bigger things, which is, you know, like I had said, the touring and the performances and such. Yeah. Um, so I do think that there is a discussion that's going to be that's going to be had with a lot of the labels and a lot of the artists. But whether or not this is a trend, I don't I don't think it's going to be a trend. Right. And Glenn, um, on your end, you know, too much emphasis on week one sales still, or is the emphasis uh, justified? I think there's always too much emphasis on week one sales, um, especially especially with uh, singles driven artists. Um, you know, with a with an album oriented artist, if it's an artist that um, doesn't get a lot of airplay and just really makes money on touring, yeah, week one sales are a pretty good indication of what the album's going to do. But for singles artists who are going to have five six songs of radio over the next two years, uh, week one def just doesn't say that much sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I think the uh, one thing to keep in mind here is to wonder: well, is radio going to accept this? Because the radio was not part of the rollout. And the music business is, is filled with easily bruised egos. And uh, partners may shy away from supporting Beyonce's album and her singles because they weren't involved leading up to the release. Now, I, I'm just guessing. I, I really don't know what's going to happen. Sure. But, um, but that's not atypical. Uh, we know Target's not going to be carrying the album. Yeah, Target's exactly. official explanation is... Is basically it's a it, it's an ordering issue because now that it's an exclusive at iTunes, it, it kind of screws up how many they would order. I think yeah. is effectively how I read into their uh, their publicist explanation. Yeah. But but really, what Target is saying is, if we weren't important enough to help roll out this album, then we're not going to carry this. And indie retail does that all the time when major retailers, uh, both brick and mortar and and digital get exclusives that are not given to indie retailers and indie yeah. retailers choose not to carry albums. These are, these are bruised egos and yeah. these are, these are partnerships that uh, have, have worked for a long time and they continue to work. That's why people go to radio and that's why people use the press. Um, and, and, and so if you don't use these partnerships, then, uh, then I think there's a big question mark about what happens in the next two years. Absolutely, you're, you're, you're completely right. And one of the things I was thinking about as well, uh, on top of just the US side of it uh, uh, alone, is uh, looking at the international uh, perspective as well at markets like Germany or Japan, where physical is still uh, really the predominant form of uh, music distribution, and uh, wondering whether if there is going to be a backlash against a release because it released in this way, uh, whether that's going to affect the release 
more significantly than it would in the US, where the physical market is really uh, a minority now uh, compared to digital and where perhaps the effect won't be as, as harshly felt. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that could be quite an interesting thing to see if in Germany there's going to be some pullbacks on, on that front. And I'll definitely uh, try and follow up with, uh, with some people in, uh, in Berlin to see yeah. what, what, what happens over there. My guess is her team and, and the label will will do a good job at working a number of singles over a number of years. I mean, she's a global star. Yeah. Um, there's going to be a lot of demand out there. I can't imagine people sitting on their hands and, and not playing her music. So, but but I think um, there might be some tough conversations ahead because of the way this album was released. Yeah, Darren. Same for for streaming services. The streaming services, of course, uh, weren't involved in this, uh, and we don't really know when it's going to come out on streaming services. It could be on the twentieth when the tracks are unbundled on iTunes, or it could be later on. Uh, do you think this is something that uh, might affect uh, some of the perspective of of uh, users uh, towards Spotify, Audio, or Deezer uh, if they don't find the latest release on there? And I know we've had um, this conversation before, but of course, you know, on a release of this scale, sometimes it makes the conversation yeah. a bit more um, tricky. <clears throat> no, I don't really think it will make a huge amount of difference, to be honest. I mean, I, you know, um, I always find it interesting when you have these exclusives because I suppose the question is, you know, if it wasn't available at Location X or Retailer Y, you know, would it still sell the same number of copies? Would you still get the same kind of surge to buy and things like that? And yeah. I think in this case, to be honest, they'll do okay. And, you know, there's been sort of other, you know, things like Mumford & Sons before certainly didn't didn't struggle on that front when they, you know, they touched down on all platforms. Right. The consumption just happened everywhere and it didn't really feel like one was cannibalizing another necessarily. But um, so I, I don't know, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see the kind of numbers it gets um, and whether... You know, I, I just, my gut feeling at the moment is just, it's kind of anecdotal. I mean, I think you see a lot of reports uh, around streaming media, but it's kind of funny when you just talk to your friends. And obviously, I think when you work in music in any capacity, whether you're on my side of it or on a press side or, or anything, you know, we're all probably using services like Spotify because we're big music fans. Um, and, you know, and among those people, it's kind of, they'll, they'll, they'll use this but you know some of them may be using it alongside itunes some instead of you know personally i don't really buy stuff from itunes so much anymore i tend to use you know streaming services a lot more um so i haven't heard the beyonce record and i won't be i guess until i you know until it touches down on the streaming platform so you know i'm sure there's people like me who will just be sort of semi-interested and will check it out when it finally arrives others probably just don't care I mean, it's interesting. I, I mean, I think the streaming services are probably not going to throw toys out the pram over this one. You know, I suspect it's more your, you know, your targets and equivalent type retailers that will have more of an issue. Or the indies where, to be honest, people are probably not going to flock to them to purchase this kind of record anyway. So they'll just take a pass on it. But um, yeah. on streaming services, I think at the moment, they're just desperate to get anyone, you know, looking their way. So having this release and waving the flag for it would probably be a wise idea, I would imagine. I, I can't see them kind of having a shit fit about it and trying to pretend it's not there. It doesn't make a lot of sense. No, and it's worth pointing out that on the front page of iTunes uh, still, uh, that's essentially the only featured thing is that album. So that's a huge thing pre-Christmas. To have. It's interesting, though, because I think in you know iTunes has, has, has taken quite a rare step i mean glenn's probably better place to comment than me but it feels like they're taking quite a rare step in running this kind of pr to to trumpet how many sales the beyonce record has had but it's interesting that i believe you know admittedly you know i'm tired and you caught me on the hop but um, <laughs> i believe the record is not going to go in at number one uh, in the uk i could no, be wrong not, but not i think UK. it's no, no. currently nestling around number sort of it's like top five but it's not yeah. going to hit the the top spot. So there's certainly a kind of counterpoint in the sense of like, I think everyone has been so sort of blown away by the press rolling around this kind of 800,000 downloads and, and all of that kind of thing. But uh, I haven't seen a huge amount of analysis as to how it breaks down by territory yeah. and whether this, despite the huge numbers, whether it could, and I'll say it in a small voice, kind of be considered, you know, not a success in the sense that maybe one could argue they should have had a you know a big number one spot. I mean, right. I'm definitely playing devil's advocate because it's Q4 and the sales figures are monstrous, you know, and particularly among major label releases. So, you know, and if if this was January, you should be sat on the number one spot for weeks because yeah. the, the, you know the sales stats would drop right off. But I do wonder because it just feels like 
everyone's pointing to this big, big number, but um, how that seems to map out, I'm not sure. And yeah, pan territories elsewhere outside of the US. Uh, yeah, it's it's sort of up for debate whether that's considered a runaway success or not. Yeah. I suspect at the minute, you know, the label is just probably sat there basking in the glory of having done this, and you know, it's considered a win all round, and they probably made a lot of money as well because of Full not price. having to plow tons of money into, you know, very expensive run up uh, marketing. Yeah, you know, yeah. pushes well, and seventeen dollars. About- I mean, that's I think that's the that still boggles my mind that it's it's that high. I mean, somebody mm. had written. I can't remember who wrote about it, talking about how the last time an album was around sixteen and seventeen dollars was in the late nineties or the early two thousands. And I, I mean, I, yeah. I think that's, I think that's one of the most wild things because I mean, you do get a lot of videos with it, so I guess there's some <laughs> argument for why it's so much because it is almost like a deluxe album. Um, but the fact that there are so many downloads with that price tag is is wild. I mean, you had Gaga with um, Born This Way when she did it for, what, 99 cents or $2 or something on Amazon. But to to have, I mean, I, personally, well, I would, was if I was Guts, I would keep it. At, oh, wait, I'm sorry. What, what was that? That was Amazon's choice to lose money on that. That had nothing to do with the label. Yeah, no, I, I'm just saying, like, in terms of, I mean, because they, they had a high amount of downloads for that. But, I mean, just seeing, like, the high amount of downloads for a $17 <coughs> price tag, I still right. think is pretty unbelievable. Um, and just, yeah. I mean, and, and again, it speaks to the fact that like only a certain artist I feel could do this because nobody would, is going to fork down like $17 for just any yeah. artist, I would say. I mean, I don't even know if Radiohead, well, maybe they probably would, but. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about what iTunes, what iTunes gave up here or gave yeah. up or allowed um, in, in I can't think of any other example where iTunes sold has sold an album without letting people download just the tracks. That's mm-hmm. that's been a reason why a lot of artists have not gone to iTunes in the past is because they want to sell just an album yeah. and they don't want people cherry picking tracks. So here we have this big release that gets a lot of exposure at iTunes. Apple's clearly given it a big wet kiss here, giving it great exposure at the homepage, giving sales updates to people to toot their own horn because it has sold really well. And it's the only example I can think of where people have not been able to buy single tracks. Now, there are some compilations, I believe, like the Now mm-hmm. compilations that are album download only, but we're talking about a, a studio album here. I can't think of any other example. And so that's, that's really remarkable to me that iTunes has, has bent its own rule for the sake of, of getting this album and the way that the artists wanted to release it. Yeah. And I, I think it's something that they should continue. I mean, I, I, if they really want to, I think if, if, they, if they are able to work with labels, I think that's a great point because I, I do think a lot of artists would actually be on board with that. And if it is only the way to get the album is through iTunes, which, I mean, if, you know, if there is bruised egos from Target and from Best Buy and from any of the other stores, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like a cynic, but I mean, these stores, they're, I mean, in the last, have you, when was the last time you walked through the CD aisle? at one of these uh, these places it's like walking through a desert ghost town i mean it's it's i don't really think there's too much of a concern i mean i would say if you're going to keep it with digital retailers i mean with itunes and its reach uh, and you're able to make these exclusives and you can uh you know guarantee some some sort of for lack of a better word ad space on their store um and that you are able to just only sell the album with the actual single tracks i think you i think that is kind of a remedy to um you know for the for the some of the sales i would say i mean because i don't i mean i especially for a market like beyonce or for a lot of the bigger mainstream you know stars where i don't think torrents and a lot of the downloads are really going to affect it so i mean i I do think that they are going to be a big you know dent on it but i do think that if it is the only place to get it the only outlet to get it at that certain time and it is such an event and people are talking about it and people are dying to get it and you are you know, you do set one price tag for the whole batch. I do think you you definitely have a better odds. I would feel, um, and again, this is just you know postulating that um, you could sell it better. I yeah. think. Yeah, I, sure. I, you know, I I I do think that that's. I mean, I, if anything, I think that could be the tr- you know the trend is you know, you're pointing out. I I think that is actually a smarter idea. Yeah. Um, is to just 
unleash that album without the individuals. And Grant, so, do, you, do you feel like it's a bit of a natural evolution as well of uh, what iTunes has been doing this year very heavily, which was the, uh, the full album uh, pre-release streams? So it feels like, you know, before it was a week, before release, you get the full album streamed. Now you get the full album to purchase, you know, exclusively on iTunes a week before, essentially, it might end up going into other stores, right? I'm sorry, I not understood the question. Like, I, um, I was wondering whether you thought it was sort of a natural evolution of, of this strategy of iTunes to uh, give pre-release streams, just because, you know, for the pre-release streams, you usually get it a week before the album is released yeah. uh, in exclusive, and then it goes on sale everywhere. And in, in a similar way, I think this release is going to go on sale everywhere a week after it's going to sell on iTunes uh, with the iTunes exclusive on sale. So that's kind of a, it's an interesting path for Apple to go down to, considering that they had a lot of success with the pre-release stream uh, route as yeah. well. I think the common thread is that, that Apple is an incredible promotional platform. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a retailer, but it's also a place to be heard. Um, it's a great partner. This is the most powerful partner that uh, a record label could have. Yeah. And so, and so the, the availability, the limited availability at Apple is, is kind of like a pre-release stream. It, it brings people to the store, and it's the only place that you can, you can buy it or yeah. listen to it. But really, I think it's just an evolution in... Um, maybe, maybe not a total evolution because we don't know how many of these that we're going to see in the future. Yeah, but it's an evolution of, of Apple and, and labels just finding different ways to work together. Um, you know, yeah. it, it's a bundle. Uh, you can't buy the tracks, and you know you'll be able to buy the tracks eventually. I think it's an experiment on uh, on on bundling music and video. It's an experiment on on the price threshold that people will be willing to pay. Yeah. So, a lot of interesting things going on here, and it's just you know it's just an evolution of experimentation. I think yeah. is ultimately what it is. Sure. Yeah. Right. Well, I think uh, unless you guys have anything else to add on that story, and we'll move on because we spent probably most of the show on that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wanted to do uh, to ask you guys uh, sort of quickly if you have uh, one story that, that, that happened this year that you feel uh, is establishing a a path or has is, is creating a, a sort of a, a, a knockout a knockdown effect where it's going to have influence in 2014 as well and maybe something that had more impact for you than other stories in the music technology world this year uh, for 20, 2013 I'll start with Darren just because so he doesn't have time to think about it because because uh, uh, <laughs> so you just have to kind of like go go with the first thing that pops in your head even if it's like complete <laughs> um, no I think that I mean I think the, the 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 sort of overarching story that's caught my eye uh, is a sort of twofold thing, really. Well, <laughs> actually, it, is, it strands out into multiple kind of a multi-headed hydra of a sort of scenario. But it's you know it's this issue of um, you know or the debate around whether Facebook is peaking as a as a platform, particularly among teens, and then the knock-on effects from that relative to the rise of, uh, you know, smaller services, but messaging apps and things like that. So that I suppose part one of that would be, you know, that story developing and what that, you know, presents as possible developments in, in 2014 by way of um, music marketing and things like that. Um, but I think it also then kind of leads on to a, a second thing of, you know, how music is marketed and, you know, whether we see more of a shift to, um, you know, a simpler and slightly more kind of creatively rather than technically led set of marketing strategies. I mean, it feels oddly like we're going back to a slightly more traditional sort of marketplace in a strange way of how we're, how music is being marketed now. Um, you know, and I think it's just from my side of it, you're seeing, you know, there's been a few attempts at sort of high concept things this year that I talked about earlier. Um, but equally, you know, I think you, you, you know, you're not seeing this kind of technical innovation such that things are coming along to replace other things super quick. You know, I think everything's slowing down a bit on that front. And as much as we grumble about Facebook, I don't think the the genuine uptake of other services is kind of at a point where it's threatening it. I think it may be running alongside it to some extent, but I, you know, I, I've just been tracking that whole thing with interest because I, you know, my own experiences around marketing artists from, you know, an unsigned level through to kind of globally known, you know, big, big stars is, is that the general engagement you're seeing on Facebook is dropping. And that then presents a question as to how one undertakes their marketing. And it feels to me like you're seeing, you know, more of a, uh, you know, a, a, 
a pushback to things like modern, you know, just standard advertising models and things like that. And just, you know, as I said, a bit more focus on just creating great things to start with. So at the risk of sounding glib, you know, making sure that obviously the album is as good as can be, but also creating great videos and not being flippant about sort of turning out something to chuck on YouTube, you know, and thinking about videos that people will want to watch over and over and share and stuff like that. So yeah. I think it's going to be really, really interesting next year. You're seeing Spotify and these streaming services try and develop more sort of social angles to them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think it was Jay Sider from um, Band Pages kind of hit the nail on the head a few months ago where he was kind of saying, you know, you may ultimately see a shift from uh, bands trying to engage fans on platforms like Facebook, maybe to people, you know, bands trying to engage them on direct platforms, you know, yeah. where the music is, like Spotify or YouTube or wherever. Yeah. And this is kind of interesting because it does also double back onto this discussion around Beyonce and iTunes in that, you know, Glenn's absolutely right. The reason this works so well for people is because, you know, when you had even the streams on iTunes, you know, iTunes is a retail platform that makes it incredibly easy to just say, yes, I'll have that, click, yeah. buy, thank you very much, mm -hmm. with a high margin for the retailer, you know, for the, the, the rights holders as well. So it's a kind of win-win for everyone involved. So, you know, with a switch away from maybe social networks like Facebook, which as lovely as they are and not particularly musically led and don't really connect well through to, you know, direct consumption and things like that, yeah. I think it could prove to be really interesting next year as you'll see, you know, Beats launch that will, you know, if everything goes as intended, that might sure. immediately kind yeah. of kickstart a bit of a competitive <laughs> element around these services to try and broaden out and socialize more and things like that, you know, yeah. and I think... For me, as a guy running a marketing agency, it's going to be really interesting to see how that affects how the artists I represent will, yeah. uh, you know, will communicate online. And and really, I suppose my my hope is that perhaps there's less focus on being doing these long run ups involving social media engagement, um, you know, to a slightly more just media led thing where you know you are back to the older model of presenting the music and sure. allowing fans to share and discuss it rather than. You know, I just feel like we've had a period where everyone's engaging people on social media just yeah. so that they can engage them. And yeah, you kind of work in a bunch of metrics that are very nice, but don't necessarily connect greatly back to the music. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that whole axis of kind of, you know, social media, where it sits in music marketing and what the streaming platforms will cool. yield for next year, how that all connects together is going to be really interesting and, and probably for me the, the big story to watch. That's awesome. Uh, Glenn, on, on your side, have you found any particular threads, uh, uh, maybe state side, that, that you thought were interesting and are going to continue uh, uh, in 2014? You know, I think the big theme in 2013 that's going to continue is YouTube. And I'm, I'm constantly amazed by how much YouTube is being embraced by the music community and entrepreneurs who are building platforms that, that tie into YouTube or, um, you know, deal with rights issues and royalties issues and uh, digital distributors who have uploaded their content to YouTube and created multi-channel networks. As I wrote in a recent column, YouTube does a lot of work to help entrepreneurs and, and to help multi-channel networks get off the ground. They have basically, think of them as account reps who, who are out there giving best practices and giving help. And, um, and it's the kind of competitive advantage, I think, that, that nobody else could match. If Yahoo tried to put together some music-focused... Uh, video network it, it wouldn't go anywhere youtube has has such a lead on everybody else and and if you know we we see this subscription service that youtube has uh, been reported to have in the works for next year i think well who knows what's going to happen with that right i mean we'll we'll know when the product's out and we'll, yeah. we'll see how consumers react to it but i think what it reinforces is that youtube is is much more dominant platform than it was a year ago and two years ago, and it's going to be much more dominant in the future. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, YouTube is definitely the one to watch for next year, especially on the, also on the pricing point. Who knows what, what they're going to price the service at? So they could undercut everybody I else. Sh <laughs> I should point out that you know YouTube came out with its YouTube Video Awards, um, so it's <laughs> yeah. an, it's another. It's just it's just kind of signals that well we've arrived. We're to the point where we can put out our own video awards and, and stream it in a really unique way. I thought the I thought the, the broadcast the, the, it was boring to watch, but I thought it was fascinating how they put it all together and presented it. Yeah. 
<laughs> I was away for that one actually in November, so I didn't I didn't watch but the extracts of it. And uh, <laughs> and Michael, for you, uh, anything uh, your end, especially from you know an editorial perspective uh, from the music front that you've seen that uh, is going to resonate into next year. Yeah, well, I mean, we've there's there's a couple of things. Well, the first one is is um, kind of just to um, to piggyback on Darren is that um, there there is a lot of uh, backlash that's happening right now against Spotify with some of the major artists. I mean, I think Johnny Marr even this morning came out and 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 went off on it, and he even went off on Heim for some reason. But um, I you know I don't know why, but um, you just throw that in there. Um, but, uh, I, you know, but um. I, I I do think it's you know a lot of these veterans that who are I don't know if it's if it's an altruistic uh, sensibility on their end but like the you know this backlash against the the streaming services and and how a lot of them you know like Tom York took took his catalog off of um, you know the the Spotify and RDIO and um, or radio and however it said and um, I, I I wonder how that's going to impact in next year if more you know bigger artists are going to kind of take heed or if their labels are going to say no 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 you, you guys got to keep this stuff on there um you know because if you don't have the support of the artists um for you know these these newer um business ventures i, I just don't see i mean i still think they can evolve and i still think they can go but if you know to tie in with Darren, what you're saying with like the social, you know, networking and having the artists involved, that's going to be such a key part to the the evolution of these services. If the artists aren't going to be on board, you know, with these things, then I, I feel like there's going to be some conflict there. Yeah, and and Spotify knows that because otherwise it wouldn't have la- uh, launched this huge initiative a couple of weeks ago around artists yeah. and just to explain what they're doing. And yeah, yeah, which we did. We, we were doing the math on that. We were just kind of boggled that. Um, it, it, there's a lot of like weird contradictions that that are um, a part of the number system there, where I do think that there's a lot of reworking that they're going to have to, um, I guess, sort out or yeah. you know figure out. But also, I, I do think that there's another big problem that I don't know if there's ever going to be a remedy for this. But you know, the the whole like Molly and MDMA, like uh, M, yeah, MDMA um, with you know the the kind of electronic festivals that are going on. You know, we reported a, a lot of that this year and um, I actually went to my first club this past weekend um, and just saw it firsthand. And, um, and it was just kind of, it, it was just such a, it was, you know, it blew me away to, to see how, you know, prevalent and how easy it all is. And, you know, having been to ultra festival down in Miami, I'm from Miami. So I, having seen it a, a bunch of times firsthand, I, I don't know if they'll ever be able to get, you know, a good a harness on, you know, making sure that that kind of proliferation of like the drug scene there is, you know, ever going to be stopped and, yeah. and what, or ever be, you know, get a handle. But I, I wonder how that's going to impact a lot of the electronic festivals and, you know, how, you know, if there are going to be lawsuits or if they're going to be a lot more that are shut down or if they're going to be a rise, I, I just think there is a, a huge impact that's still <laughs> been, um, there. And, you know, as we've seen with the largely successful drug war in this country, um, no, yeah. not, um, I, I don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, but it's interesting, actually, because it's something that doesn't really resonate much here. Uh, I mean, at least you don't see as much coverage of it, but I guess in the US it's a different thing. <clears throat> yeah, well, I think it's because over here it kind of happened. The whole kind of E thing was about sort of 1988 to 91 when it was, <laughs> yeah, you know, and we did have that where you had deaths in clubs and... You know, I remember over here there was Club UK, which um, you know was a, a big, big club in the day, and they used to turn off the taps and sell everyone water at sort of two pounds fifty a bottle. You know, and you kind of look back on that now, and it's amazing that nobody got you know banged up for uh, for you know manslaughter charges or whatever else. I mean, it was really, really bad. Um, and you know, it's interesting hearing you say that. I mean, you know, there is an EDM thing over here as well. Uh, it's a problem that needs stamping out. Um, but, but um, you know, it, yeah, with reference to the original, the sort of first time out with that whole kind of ecstasy explosion and, and all of that, it just it just passes. It's kind of weird, isn't it? All these things come along and, and everyone stands there saying, what can we do about the menace of and insert name of yeah. current thing here? And it, and it does pass, but it's usually, uh, you know, as you say, it's, there's casualties along the way, and I suspect yeah. states, stateside, particularly being, you know, there's there's much more of a sort of, uh, you know, suing lawsuit type thing there around 
around these kinds of things. You know, I think in the UK when those things happened, the focus was on the poor kid that died and there was less of this sort of we should take action against the clubs. You know, it's sort of just assumed that the police would do it and people here don't feel quite so kind of empowered as to necessarily bring lawsuits and stuff like that. Right, so yeah. I think stateside you could see this really, really blow up in someone's face because if it's anything like, you know, the, the, when it, the, the way it was in the UK when we, we had that first kind of ecstasy explosion, it was, you know, then there were deaths and it was not very pleasant. And in the end, I think it led to a lot of people taking a long, hard look at their lifestyle and weighing up whether they wanted to run a risk of being the next person winding yeah. up, you know, in the mortuary. So who knows? But yeah, I think it'd be very interesting to see because it feels like the whole EDM thing is at some point, you know, it will be that thing that someone just really enjoys turning on and ripping to bits in the same manner as disco, you know, where they're suddenly they're tossing all the vinyl on a fire in the middle of yeah. the stadium and all that stuff. Glenn, so, Glenn do you think this will yeah, affect the SFX the stock price as well? <laughs> no, I, you know, I think, I think uh, promoters are going to be fine. And right. I, I don't know if it's going to happen in 2014, but I do think America is, is taking a look at its, its drug policy. And, and, and not being so heavy handed and, and, and being less heavy handed and be more practical uh, and, and, you know, that charging for a lot for bottled water is a good example. If you want to hydrate people, then hydrate people. Don't sell them expensive water at festivals. Yeah. Um, I think more practical uh, approaches to drug use, um, not just in EDM and not just around music, but in, in the country in general. Yeah. I think it's going to be something that we'll, we'll look at in the coming years. Now, exactly when that's going to happen, you know, who knows? Who knows? But um, I, I think that's one thing that's going to come of Obama's second term is is, is a change in um, attitudes toward drugs. Hopefully, yeah. And uh, uh, well, for my two cents, I thought you know one of the things that came up this year, early this year, that kind of dragged on and it's going to drag on into next year was the announcement itself of Beats Music uh, because. It kind of generated a whole wave of uh, people starting to talk about recommendation and whether that's really the key or whether it's not. We don't yet know. We'll, we'll know next year, maybe towards the end of next year, whether recommendation was the key and whether that's really generating meaningful changes in the way that people listen to uh, streaming music services and use them. Uh, but the fact that they announced that product, uh, I think that pushed Spotify to perhaps further its agenda on that front a little bit more and, and other services to really look uh, really hard at what they were doing in the same front. And also the partnership of Spotify with Topspin perhaps wouldn't have happened if they hadn't announced that back in January. Mm. So maybe that's a thread that I thought I'd throw in there. That was quite interesting for, for the past year. And, uh, 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 oh wow, we're, we're already like... Uh, almost towards the end of the show so i'm just gonna have to pick and choose something we're gonna talk about next and i think i'm gonna talk about uh, the itunes uh, top apps uh, leading into uh, the world of music startups for next year so uh, itunes announced uh, its usual best of 2013 as far as uh, you know both music and uh, apps are concerned and uh, so i made a list of some of the uh, most uh, you know talked about apps on the music space uh, so uh, itunes listed as uh, uh, most innovative apps uh, 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 Soundwave, which is a Dublin-based uh, music discovery app uh, that I've interviewed on the show actually in the past. Uh, then Tractor DJ, uh, Guitar by Smule, uh, Splice DJ 2 for iPhone, and Music. So there are two DJing apps, two music-making apps, one music player, and a social music slash music discovery application. But when we look at top-grossing apps, then Pandora is number three uh, in the States, which is pretty awesome, uh, considering that uh, you know there's a lot of uh, very... Uh, profitable apps up there in, in the charts uh, and then we have to go quite a bit down to find uh, something like Ardio, Slacker and uh, Smule Magic Piano as the top grossing apps so a completely different uh, uh, top grossing list than, than the, the most innovative apps of course because those are quite new and uh, I also found a bunch of apps in the top uh, most uh, top um, free apps uh, charts uh, which are called something like mp3 free downloads free download mp3s and there's a bunch of very similar apps that are all sort of hovering around the 35 40 uh, you know, peg in the top downloaded free apps uh, on iTunes for, for the past year, which is pretty incredible considering that they're uh, terrible apps. So definitely, I think I think they show that there's a definite need for, for uh, more music uh, available on the iTunes store because people are downloading those apps so, uh, and they're terrible. Um, and so looking at that collectively, essentially, you know, we got a lot of music making apps, we got a few music discovery applications and we got some straight up services like Pandora. Uh, are we going to see a lot more innovation, do you think, in this space, Darren? Uh, do you think that, you know, we come to 
uh, the the end of the big wave of of uh, developments, uh, and uh, also we can tie that in with the Medium Lab announcements. You know, there's a, a new contest for 2014, which is uh, at Medium. It's the best uh, new music startups uh, around, and uh, and uh, sort of tie that in into how many of those are going to be able to. Uh, get to the end of 2014 and say all oh, these were showcased that's the best apps uh, of, of uh, 2014 uh, what are your thoughts on uh, music tech and do you think that uh, there is the opportunity to see a lot more innovation for the next uh, uh, 12 months I mean I, th I think it's you know it speaks volumes that Pandora is sort of up there in the you know in the, the top of the chart because I think the biggest problem around music is that people that are in music love it and and you know obsess over it constantly but I think to the average man in the street, it's kind of like beyond a, an app that just plays music, it's up for question how much anyone feels they need these other kinds of apps. I mean, that was the problem I had with Soundwave was that it felt a little bit like a sort of feature, not a company type thing to me in that it's cool, but it's over there. And it's a bit like Twitter music was where you sort of look at it and say, well, when I'm using it, it's not bad, but I just don't really understand why it's over here when I'm on Twitter over here, you know, and, it, and it's very disconnected. And I suppose it's the same problem for people like Soundwave is that we're reaching this point, as I kind of said earlier, where technically we're perhaps all slowing down a bit. We're not kind of running from this service to that one to that one. Everyone's picking their spots and, you know, we're kind of getting a bit comfy in there and we're not so keen to kind of up sticks and move everything over to a different service. So, you know, within that, People like Soundwave, I think, struggle to, you know, provide a good enough reason for you to keep using it. Because Discovery, I mean, it, that one can rage for ages. I mean, I still personally don't feel Discovery is a, a particularly massive problem that needs solving. I think its value has been somewhat overrated. But, we'll um, see. <laughs> we'll have to yeah, decide. I mean, no, absolutely. Time will tell. <laughs> but I think the difference is that if someone like Beats comes along and they play the music and marry it with Discovery well, then it's a cool feature and it's just a great thing to have within the same service. But when yeah. the discovery's over there and the music player is over there, then, you, you know, you, it's, not, it's not working for you. You know, it's like having the car with no petrol on the forecourt and the petrol station three miles away. I mean, those are two <laughs> very complementary things, but they need to be, you know, the petrol's got to be in the car. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a tricky one. But beyond that, in terms of musical innovation, I think it's... Um, it's slowed down a bit. I haven't seen as much stuff to really blow me away, if I'm completely honest. But then I suspect part of that's just something of a slowing of the platform, you know. I mean, yeah. certainly on iOS, I don't really think new things have come out that have massively opened up a wealth of new parameters for developers to, to mess around with. Um, Android, I mean, you know, I use an Android phone, and I do enjoy uh, – looking into what's possible there because it's a slightly more open framework and stuff. But I'm very conscious that you're still really quite in geek territory and, and as lovely as an Android phone is, you know, I wouldn't recommend one to my mum, whereas yeah. I'd definitely tell her to get an iPhone because it just works and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see what comes, but I, I do feel to some extent like there's a bit of a <clears> – <throat> I think people are cooling a bit on apps generally. I could be wrong on that front, but, you know, there's a lot of things now that are just met with a decent website rather yeah. than an app. <clears throat> and I think that's changing people's view, you know, as that stuff isn't, I don't find myself, you know, installing as many apps as I ever used to, but yeah. maybe that's just me. I, yeah, I think, I think like the, I, I got to put back on that. Cause like, um, we did, uh, we actually launched an app back in 2012 and one of the struggles that we, um, we encountered was that, you know, I mean, so much of an app is is what can you use on a day to day basis. I mean, it, you know, like I, I kind of look back on, you know, fun things that have that take the idea of music and then they make it into a fun little medium like Turntable FM or whatever. I mean, like that was a lot of fun for you know a week or two, and then you move on, and at the end of the day, you just kind of want to listen to music. And as long as you have a tool that you're used to, you know, as Darren was pointing out, I, I do think that it's kind of like uh, the stuff that you pick up before you leave the house, you know, your wallet, your keys, your phone, your shoes, obviously, but, um, and, and then you leave. I, I think that's the same way with like almost apps is that once you're at this comfort level where you, you know, you are discovering and you are, you know, finding the music and you, you have a medium that you've been used to at this point. Um, you know, I think these upstarts, the problem is, is that, you know, they keep trying to find new ways to experience the music, but I, I think that 
a lot of people are comfortable with the way that they're, they are experiencing it right now. So that I, I do think that like any type of kind of wrench that you throw in that, I, I think the longevity of it is, is just, is just harder to kind of, um, is to kind of grasp. And, um, it, you have to really, really come up with something that that's a practical tool that's going to tie into day to day life. And, and, you know, and that, that was the, the problem that we had with the app when we launched last year was just, kind of figuring out, well, you know, why, what makes this better than just going to the website or, you know, finding out or, or even just, you know, continuing using the stuff that you already have. And, um, and, and I have found myself with downloading less apps also, I mean, because, you know, there, there really isn't like, I mean, you know, you have the Yelp app, you have the, I mean, like, there, there are only so many things that you should, you need to do yeah. during the day for knowledge. <laughs> and once you have those tools, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, throwing a little wrench in, in, into it isn't so much, isn't so necessary. And, yeah. you know, it might be like a little fad that you have for two weeks, like the turntable thing, and then all of a sudden it dies out and then there's a new thing. And, um, but at the end of the day, like, I mean, Pandora is such an established name, almost like YouTube at this point that I don't, um, it doesn't surprise me that it's at the top. And, yeah. and, and like Darren said, that, that, you know, even those that, that don't have the smartphones that don't, necessarily want to be part of the geeky tech parts i mean pandora is great for that because all you really have to do is you know you put in the few names and then you're there you don't have to like really think about it too much or create a user profile or do all these other customizations it's it's very hands-on and easy um yeah and i think that's kind of one of the problems that a lot of new apps don't do is i think they do overcomplicate things a lot and it's so niche you know but yeah Mm -hmm. yeah sure makes sense Uh, glenn sorry uh just uh uh, before you you say your um you're a bit on that. Just asking you a clarification. It's Pandora because we don't have Pandora in the US, in, in the UK. Uh, uh, is it top grossing because it has the opportunity to subscribe to the premium part of it via the app? And so they actually give away that part of the cash to, uh, to Apple? W- why is it making so much yeah. money? Yeah, you know, right. earlier this year, Pandora took steps to limit uh, mobile listening hours. Right. Just to basically get their royalties in check. Um, and that lasted for, I forget exactly how long, a few months, and then yeah. they dropped that. Uh, but the result of that was that um, was that they increased subscribers quite a bit, right. and you could either subscribe for the year or you could subscribe. I think pay ninety nine cents and listen through the rest of the month, ad free. And, and that was via and, via the Apple Store. So and in app purchases uh, were a big part of that. So that's really why Pandora is up there. It's because of in app so, purchases and it's because of this this move, this strategy they had earlier in yeah. the year to limit. Uh, just runaway mobile listening, basically, because they want to monetize it better um, until their ability to monetize it better uh, has caught up. They couldn't let people just listen as much as they wanted to. Awesome. Well, thanks for clarifying that, because yeah, I, I had I had I was wasn't really sure as to why they were up there. Uh, sorry, just going moving back to what we're talking about. You know, what are your thoughts on music tech innovation for next year? Do you reckon we're going to find some more breakthrough apps, or is it going to be down to the big players? Well. I think there's a couple different categories of apps. There's the music creation apps, which I think there's always going to be great stuff coming out. Yeah. Um, you know, especially for tablets, uh, you have music creation and recording and DJ tools. You have apps, um, apps acting as guitar pedals, um, all kinds of great stuff. And that's going to continue. Um, but I think what we're tend to talk about here is stuff with, with licensed recorded music or, uh, or, or functions of that. And, and what I see is just a lot of functions in those standalone companies and a lot of features and and, and nothing that's really going to stand on its own. There are very few things that's going to stand on its own. So, uh, dude, does the world really need, you know, five or ten music discovery apps? Probably not. I don't even know if we need one standalone music discovery app. I think they need to be built into the services people already use. Uh, The same goes for concert finders. I I don't know if any of these are going to work. And I don't know if anybody wants to launch an app that's just going to be in a total niche of the live music world. Um, but there are a lot of these services out there, and a lot of them are mobile-first companies because uh, because they want to they want to get in on how people discover events and buy tickets. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm just not convinced that it's a very mainstream product. How many times a week are you going to open up that app? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I use Google Maps and the New York Times, and other, after those two apps, it's a pretty big drop off. And I'm sure for most people, it's, it's the same. You use a few. And, and beyond that, there's a lot of unused apps and apps in your smartphone. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, there's one app that I found, actually, sorry, I'm losing my voice, I can't stop coughing. Uh, there's one app that I found last week, actually, that I've, I've, I was amazed at and had been as amazed in ages by an app, and it's called Moves. Uh, it's been around for a while, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was featured by Apple uh, quite a bit. And you can track your whereabouts and your movements oh, yeah. uh, really accurately. It's really mm-hmm. worth getting because uh, I haven't found an app that can monitor background uh, movements quite so well. And it correctly picks up if you're walking, cycling, taking public transport, and I've used it all week in London, and it works perfectly. But it also pinpoints where you've been. So after that, mm. you can go and edit where you've been, and you can actually tell it, oh, it's a bit like a Foursquare-like feature. You can just pinpoint where exactly you were in that location uh, really easily, because it's got a list of places nearby already. And then you have a complete list of what you've done that day with the steps walked, miles cycled, uh, public transportation, everything you've done, which is really cool. Uh, so mm. yeah, I just thought I'd point that out. Uh, it doesn't, just, does it make it public? Cause my no, it's private. Like it's private. Shops and, and McDonald's and... Uh, <laughs> no, it's a completely private. List ever. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it no, sounds we, like weirdly, I mean, it, that's the thing. It's like on, on my, I, I've got a Nexus 4, and I didn't realize that the fucking phone does that anyway. Like Google... <laughs> sent me an activity report and said, you walk this far. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, like, right. You don't need moves because Google is just all over me. Uh, and so, yeah. Nice. I think That's quite no scary, though. There's app on Android. Yeah, I know. It's, well, it's this just, is I local mean, data. That's a cool thing. It's all localized. It, it, it's not up, uploaded yeah. anywhere. So. I mean, that's yeah. the thing with Google generally, isn't it? There's a part of you, it's like 50% that goes, wow, that's really cool. And yeah. the other 50% thinks they're literally building like Skynet. You know, it's yeah. just exactly. yeah, right. terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, yeah they're, they're tracking me and they know when I'm running and stuff. Which yeah. is, you know, clearly not very often. Um, it but, sounds like a really good app for a blackout drunk, but, you know, with, with the, <laughs> yeah. the concerns yeah. about the NSA in this country, I'm not... I don't, I don't know that, that, would be, that, so. that would be the end of the Hangover movie, wouldn't it? It would be like, yeah, oh, okay, yeah. we've been there, we've done that, okay, we can just go back. Oh. Yeah, this is what you Problem did. solved. Yeah. Problem yeah, solved, okay. that's it. Uh, oh, the horror. <laughs> no, and I, I, I tied into another app called Momento, which is a really good, like, uh, sort of... Uh, it gathers all the social data uh, and it mm. pulls them all in a like a day by day thing, and it also inserts all the information from that automatically, so you don't have to do anything, and you have like some sort of. It's funny of... though because I I've used both those apps before I switched to an Android phone, right? And uh, it's weird. Like I, I mean, you and I probably differ on this, but there, I definitely had this view of like I know where I've been, so I don't really like I used Moose for about a week, and then I was a bit just like <laughs> I, I kind of know what I did. I don't care how many steps I took, and I no, know I'm fat. Either. So if it's done on like a get get you know get healthy, yeah. I can probably look in the mirror and, and answer that question, which would be a no, clearly. Um, <laughs> but in, in the same for Memento, I just started putting things in it, and then after a week, it was like I'm uh, realizing the absolute tedium of my life. It was yeah. kind of like, I but at the I'll same time, now. you don't have to do anything with either of those apps, and at least you end up with some sort of recollection of what you've been doing like at the moment it's my google google calendar like i get a text for somebody and i haven't put their phone in and it'll be like oh hi it's john and blah 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 and i'm like oh who's john uh, and then i go to their first text they send me and i find out where my google calendar when i met them on that day and then i can track back stuff like that it's it's a very specific case scenario but i'm trying to justify it like that it's it's not working <laughs> I, have to say, actually, I did have it once on my phone just on that <laughs> that texting horror where uh, I can't name the band, but a member of a very, very famous band texted me with a technical query and I hadn't saved his name. And I just like, sorry, who the hell is this? <laughs> and I've got a text going, it's blah from blah. And I was just like, oh, oh shit. <laughs> like, Great. Well played. Well nice. done, Darren. <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> All time cock up. Cool. Well, guys, thanks so much. Uh, I think we should uh, wrap it up here, but uh, we can't wrap it up before doing last minute plugs and uh, uh, New Year's wishes for everybody as well. So uh, I guess, uh, uh, Michael, you want to start with, a, you know, you can plug Consequence of Sound or any initiative that you have going on at the moment that you want people sure, to check sure. out? Sure. Um, we're uh, just at the, uh, well, I mean, we can, you know, we finished our uh, annual report and we're just kind of doing more. Um, superlatives at the, at the end right now and then we have our brand new site that's launching uh, in the first or second week of January um, depending on how well we uh, do the testing of the next couple of weeks <laughs> so, the but second yeah, week sounds like exciting. a good bet <laughs> yeah second week we're probably going to aim for but yeah. uh, so that that's that's the most exciting part that's also. awesome and that's at a consequence of sound.com right uh, d- dot net dot com, dot com it doesn't either one yeah anything works great 
Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Glenn, on your end, uh, anything uh, happening on uh, Billboard business uh, that people should be aware of? Well, we're, we're putting together, I think the year-end issue is, uh, is in the past, and, and we're putting together some stuff to look forward to next year. And, um, and then the Power 100 list comes out uh, early in 2014, and, uh, you know, it, it never quite stops at Billboard, so we have okay. a lot of good stuff coming up. <laughs> I'm sure. And of course, it's a billboard.com slash biz. And if you uh, don't visit the site, often you should do or you should bookmark it, bookmark it on uh, any feed reader that you use or anything like that. Because that's the business site. Yeah, there's the billboard.com is the consumer facing yeah. stuff. The, the billboard.com slash biz is the business stuff. And of course, there's the magazine, the conferences. Yeah. And uh, my Twitter handle is at Billboard Glenn, if yeah. you want to. If you want to see if I tweet on any given Absolutely. day, it's hard to say what I do. <laughs> Will you or won't he? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Billboard is a, is a really fantastic resource. I, I, I use it all the time. And it's uh, definitely one of the better value subscriptions out there as well. So definitely good to have. And Darren, on your end, of course, it's motiveunknown.com. You have a fantastic newsletter that I can plug for you. Uh, just a daily digest. <laughs> <Thanks>, <laughs> That if you go on motiveunknown.com, you'll find the links on there. It's a great daily newsletter of what's going on in the social media and the music uh, uh, space uh, with a little uh, intro from Darren, which is usually quite uh, insightful and, and, and really good. Uh, uh, anything else you want to plug aside from that? Because I've already plugged that for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll just get my coat. Uh, no, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I, I, it's, it's been good. I mean, the last couple of weeks have been nice. I've got two artists at the Radio 1 playlist in the form of Vance Joy and Rye X, which is great. Uh, it was brilliant to see on Songkick the hardest working bands in the world, local natives, take the number one spot for most gigs played. And then Alt-J were at number three. And uh, I think they're the number one spot for um, distance travelled around gigs as well. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> um, you know, it's equally cool in that they're doing some work with Greenpeace or some environmental charity at the moment. Okay. And I thought that awesome. the distance travelled thing probably might, um, <laughs> <laughs> might, might, might not be highlighted. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> Um, and then beyond that, no, the, the big one I wanted to give a, a, a sort of plug for was um, uh, Fabric's label Houndstooth, which has very much sort of flown under the radar through this year. I work with them, they're their artist kind of label that's on a par with Ninja Tune and Warp. But it has to be said, the recognition they're getting in the, in the sort of end of year lists is just astonishing. You know, they're, I think, their Accelerator's album of the uh, label of the year. The Arts Desk website just gave the special request album, album of the year. They've been in top fives for either their releases or just as a label on a whole, um, just across the board. You know, all of the, the dance type sites are covering them and really <coughs> getting passionate about what they're doing. So, you know, it's a small label run with a, a lot of heart and soul. And right. um, I just thoroughly recommend people look Houndstooth up. They're really, you know, and the special request album in particular, if you are a man of a certain age, which... Uh, I am, you know, as sort of closing on 40, then uh, special request will remind us all of the kind of ravey period of about 1991 to 94, which is like the golden age for people like me. And he just kind of has just fully resurrected that with bells on. So uh, awesome. go and look up the special request album because it's absolutely awesome. <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks so much, guys. Oh, ah. Uh... I forgot to ask Glenn, uh, Glenn about his uh, trip to East Africa and the services that they were using out there, but I guess we'll have to leave that for another show. <laughs> oh, even on a hangar. Go on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what I'll do is, I'll, how about after this, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet out a link to uh, one startup, digital music startup, that awesome. I, I met while I'm there. Very interesting. I, let me just say that... Um, you know, the Deezers of the world are, are not going to be doing anything in East Africa anytime soon. There's a lot of piracy. Uh, there's just a different way of acquiring music and, and paying for goods, uh, paying for digital goods. And, and, you know, it's not a credit card thing. It's a mobile payment thing. And really the, the, the two biggest formats are the CD and the USB drive. And, oh, uh, yeah. and, and I've seen USB drives very popular in other developing countries too. So it's, it's a really different world that um, is, is I, I think people just don't have much visibility into. Yeah.
And USB drive is very popular also with independent bands. <laughs> These days. Yeah. I have a drawer full of them, so <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting one well thanks so much Glenn and absolutely really interested in, in that as well because uh, I'm doing a panel on, on a very similar subject at South by next year so uh, we don't have anybody from Africa unfortunately we have somebody from the Middle East from Angami that's uh, gonna uh, talk at that but uh, yeah very cool stuff and uh, thanks so much for joining me guys uh, and uh, have a great uh, great Christmas holidays I'm saying happy holidays happy holidays it's more PC <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and we get offended uh, no I'm just joking <laughs> Well, some people in the UK get offended because they think it's American, but I'm kind of trying to like... <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I don't know, oh, yeah. come on. Why not, for Christ's sake? You're trying to wish someone a good holiday. I know, exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's difficult. What if anyone would come back from that with being outraged? Really? When you're wishing them well. Like, Damn well, you. Yeah, uh, And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, have a fantastic Christmas break and thanks so much for uh, listening to the show. The <coughs> Digital Music Trends will resume on the uh, 8th of January. It's the next recording, so it will come out on the 9th. Uh, in the meantime, the show will continue. There's going to be shows coming out all the way uh, across Christmas. It's just not uh, uh, news or live shows, pre-recorded pre shows, which is uh, much uh, better for all of us. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.